Case at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. Governor Greg Abbott's defense of the state's new abortion law raising some eyebrows. Yeah, asked yesterday about that law, which outlaws most abortions past six weeks and does not make exemptions for rape or incest for victims. Abbott said in part that Texas's goal was to eliminate rape. Our Garrett Berger talked with a local organization that helps rape survivors about how feasible that really is. Rape? is a crime and Texas will work tirelessly to make sure that we eliminate all rapists from the streets of Texas by aggressively going out and uh, arresting them and prosecuting them and getting them off the streets. To Crisis Center of Kamal County Program Director Tamara Acosta, Governor Greg Abbott's goal may be admirable, but it's an unlikely one. The problem isn't a system or a process. The problem is the human heart. Acosta says Abbott's comments don't seem to take in all the shades of the issue. It's not just a stranger someone meets at the bar who could be a rapist. Sometimes it's a victim's family member or even their spouse. The sad case is that um, compliance isn't always consent. There's also the scope of the problem. According to the Rape, Abuse and Incest National Network website, more than two thirds of rapes go unreported. And DPS statistics show less than a quarter of more than 14,500 rapes, including attempts, reported in Texas in 2019 resulted in an arrest. Acosta says lengthy investigations can be daunting for rape survivors. They see this and they're like, it's going to take so long, I'd rather not even prosecute. I don't, I don't want to go, I don't want to take that route. I did the exam, you guys have the report, like it happened, I want to move on. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Now that SB1 has become law, many in the disability community predict the state's new voting law will make it harder for them to vote. That's why disability rights organizations are among the groups that have filed lawsuits trying to stop the new voting law from going into effect. Yet it may be at least December before it does go into effect. The Bear County Elections Administrator says by law it'll be not be it'll be 91 days after the special session ended, but even then litigation could delay it even further. So will redistricting, depending on how long that takes or any lawsuits that come after that. Until then, the disability organizations say they are making an all-out effort to answer any questions and call many fears they may have about not being able to vote. We're going to do everything to try to educate our people and keep the turnout going, but it is right now sending a chilling effect. Among their concerns, having to verify they need personal attendance to help them vote, even if their disability is not one that can be seen. They say under the new law, those attendants could be charged with a felony if poll watchers believe they're interfering instead of helping. The historic outcry, come and take it, has come and gone at UTSA. That slogan, part of a Texas history and now also a thing of the past for the student section during UTSA football games. Jonathan Cotto with what some students are saying about the end of this tradition. Come and take it, a popular and historic slogan seen across Texas, but especially heard during the fourth quarter of football games here at UTSA. That fourth quarter, now look, and sound differently moving forward. If you've attended a UTSA football game within the last six years, you've probably seen the tradition that's rattled the bleachers of the student section during the fourth quarter of the Roadrunners football games up until now. We're talking about the running of an enormous flag that read, come and take it. Those same words almost always echoing from the stadium followed by a cannon blast. On Tuesday, the university's president, Taylor Amy said, come and take it, would no longer be a part of the school's tradition. The slogan's fine. I don't think it's causing no harm to anyone directly, no harm to like a specific group of people. So I think the president should allow it. I don't think it's that big of a deal. I think there's more pressing matters. If he were to be wanting to focus on something, it should be something that is more uh, important like to a student's everyday life than some slogan for a football game. However, come and take it was up for debate after a long time UTSA professor started a petition against the slogan saying it, quote, embodies both anti-Mexican and pro-slavery sentiments. Amy says the rallying cry has become a distraction from the university's mission. Although some students we talked to said the university never asked for their opinion and that students should stand up for the tradition. I don't really appreciate it. I really, uh, I like the tradition, you know, UTSA is still a very, very young uh, campus, a very young university and our football program is only a decade old and so I think having that tradition was really awesome to like rally in the fourth quarter 
and to just take it away from us uh, without even getting like students insight is pretty insensitive. However, it's a fight that appears to be over as the university will remove the slogan from its digital platforms, licensed merchandise and UTSA buildings. Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. For some, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought stress, fear, and isolation. As college students return to campus, a local police department wants to be prepared to handle mental health calls. Tiffany Huertas has more on UTSA's new training that could help improve the lives of students. We recognize that with students returning to campus and things that we've seen during the pandemic, we recognize that um, our mental health calls were going to probably exceed uh, you know, what we had the last couple of years. UTSA Police Captain Thomas Colucci says a group of officers will be trained by professors from the Department of Counseling on various aspects of mental health. We'll be talking about crisis intervention. We'll be talking about uh, psychotic disorders. We'll be talking about de-escalation techniques. Colucci says he wants officers to be prepared to respond to any calls and ready to switch gears at any moment. If the person there is needing mental health support to be able to, again, mitigate that situation right there, but then funnel them towards long-term resources. They're that first line of mental health um, intervention or response. We want them to be equipped with the tools that they need to help our community. Professor Heather Trepal with the Department of Counseling says there could be negative consequences without proper training. We could have you know, some mental health is, um, issues escalate or some other ones, on the other hand, fall through the cracks and not receive maybe the direct coordination of mental health services that the person needs. We just want to help you succeed here at this university and get you the help that you need. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. San Antonio police are hoping for some help catching up with a killer in a two-year-old murder case. This happened back in September of 2019 in the 3800 block of East Commerce Street on the city's east side. That's where officers found 36-year-old Anthony Donnell Clark dead. They say he had been shot in the head from a distance with a high-powered rifle. Other than that detail, investigators don't have much more to go on. If you have any information that could help them out, call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. Two weeks after the crime, San Antonio police say they caught up to one of the people wanted in connection with a carjacking and robbery in the parking lot of a far northwest side HEB. 17-year-old Sebastian Guerra has been charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Officers say they responded to a robbery call August 22nd at the HEB at I-10 and Bernie Stage Road. The alleged victim told them a car with men inside pulled up to her. They got out pointing guns. She says they took her keys and other belongings before driving off in her vehicle. So far, Guerra is the only one identified and arrested. A year ago, the Bear Gives Back sentencing program started as a way to keep the jail population down and so far to save thousands in taxpayer dollars. Erica Hernandez has more on how that program is hoping to continue its efforts for many years to come. Just some, some minor lawn maintenance type stuff. Last year, Sheriff Javier Salazar and 226 District Judge Velia Mesa joined together to launch a program during the pandemic that would help the court systems, the jail population, the community, and low-level offenders. People are, instead of spending time in, in jail, uh, being consumers of, of taxpayer dollars, they're out giving back to the community by way of work. Bear Gives Back in its first year had five judges participate and 125 defendants complete the program. So you're looking at over $400,000 that we didn't have to spend because we gave the nonviolent offenders this opportunity. Some of the community service involves includes trash pickup along the highways as well as community assistance and park cleanup. It's a win-win situation. A win for them and that they're able to, you know, serve their sentence and provide a service to the community. Not every offender will qualify, but in the end, the hope is to get more judges to use the program to keep more nonviolent offenders out of jail. Some people need an opportunity just to uh, have a hand reached out to them to help them out and say, hey, it's OK, you messed up, but there's an opportunity for you to correct things. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Take a look outside with live cam this evening. Of course, another hot one out there. But as I understand it, 
Got some rain chances to talk about. Oh, Myra, you're listening so carefully. <laughs> oh, I'm paying attention. Yes, exactly. We do. Uh, we have some rain chances coming down the line, and I'll really jump into that in more detail coming up. Uh, but the rain chances look promising. That's what I like about it. We're not just thinking oh, 20% here and there. Better odds than that. Today, 100 degrees officially at the airport. That's the second 100 degree day so far this year. And we're one degree shy of the record high at the International Airport in town. Several locations at triple digits. You get to Pleasanton, Catula, Laredo, Creasel Springs, Del Rio, all at or above 100 for high temperatures today. The rest of this week, we're going to see high temps right near 100. That goes all the way through Saturday, but by Sunday and next week, notice that drop off. That's significant just because it also signifies a shift in our weather pattern. And we're going to talk about the rain chances that come with that shift coming right up. Despite all the deaths and overburdened hospitals, some scientists believe there's a silver lining to the Delta variant's rapid spread. We'll explain tonight on the night beat. Doctor said, okay, well, you're gonna be paralyzed for the rest of your life. And defying the odds, a U.S. Army Green Beret told he would never walk again after being hit by an RPG in his vehicle in Afghanistan four years ago. Tonight, his story of grit and survival as he reflects on the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. It is something all too common on San Antonio highways, wrong way driving. And one study found that Texas leads the nation when it comes to fatalities. Our Samuel King joins us now live. And Samuel, there are ways drivers can protect themselves. Yeah, that's right, Tim and Myra. We're talking about things about being alert and paying attention to signs as well as limiting distractions. You can fly over 35, looks like southbound on northbound. Uh getting a couple different descriptions but wrong way. This driver going the wrong way on I-35 downtown last weekend was one of several recent wrong way driving incidents in our area. This one on Loop 410 in Castle Hills late last month left the driver dead. Almost always these wrong way crashes are fatal because they are typically head on collisions that seemingly come out of nowhere. Doug Shoup with AAA Texas says the three common causes of these crashes are alcohol impairment, older age, and people who are driving alone. They don't have someone in the vehicle who can alert them, hey, you've made the wrong decision, you've gone the wrong way, you're entering the highway at the wrong way. SAPD tells me the most common lane where wrong way drivers are found is the left lane or the fast lane. So they advise the drivers move over to the middle or the right to stay out of the way of those wrong way drivers. And also be sure to honk your horn or flash your lights to try to get the wrong way driver's attention. We want people to know that this is a persistent problem and it's a growing problem, but there are steps that can be taken to prevent these types of tragedies. And Chup says things like making signs more visible and building more barriers between lanes. Those are things that uh, transportation officials are doing to help cut down on that problem. Let's take a look at traffic uh, this evening. This is a Loop 410 at McCullough. We had a crash here that was causing some major backups, but within the past uh, few minutes or so, uh, that appears to have been cleared up and things are moving a little bit better here. So this is the area we're talking about near the airport. Here's McCullough. Here is a uh, westbound 410, which seems to have more of the problems now. That crash is actually in the eastbound lanes. So taking a look at your travel time between uh, I-10 and 281 eastbound, now down to six minutes, eight minutes the other way. A a lot different than it was at the top of the hours, about 10 to 15 minutes each direction. Take a look at the west side. We do have a crash here near 1604 in Calibra and on 151 right now, a bit of a slowdown as you're approaching 1604. So seven minutes to get from Loop 410 to 1604. Again, crash there on Loop 410 at McCullough has cleared. We'll keep an eye on things throughout the hour, guys. Thank you, Samuel. We'll take a live look outside with Sky 12 tonight over the tube chute there up in New Braunfels on the Comal River. A great place to cool off on a hot one like today. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people probably needing that today. But Adam kasky has got us interested. You're selling these rain chances. They sound... <laughs> They sound pretty promising. Right now they're looking much better than uh, what we've really seen recently in the longer range. That's what I like about it. It's they just look more promising even five, six, seven days out. That's the nice thing about it. So the next couple of days, no rain, not even a shot. We're talking nothing but a clear sky. We're going to be hard pressed to even get a cloud in the sky Thursday through Saturday. Once we get into Sunday and early next week, 
see a little more moisture in the air and some energy and I, we start to see those rain chances climb up and right now I've got them at about 40% by Monday. So in the scattered category, so let's get right to it. We're going to start with that our overall weather pattern and what's happening out there. Currently we've got a little burst of energy that's moving in through the hill country. So a few downpours here and there. They're isolated in nature and really having a hard time holding together, but there has been some lightning and thunder Gillespie County, Kimball County, and now moving into northern Edwards County. That's the exception currently. The norm is nothing but sunshine. You look at the big picture and that's what we have around here. It's this little burst of energy from Dallas headed toward Del Rio. That's kickstarting a few of those thunderstorms, Edwards Plateau and parts of the hill country. It's going to be really difficult for any more development the closer we get to sunset. So by and large, we'll just be clearing out tonight with those few exceptions in the hill country. Here's our pattern. Upper level high, the big blue H, that's really sitting right over Utah at this time. That gives us this northerly flow aloft, and it's a dry northerly flow, relatively speaking. I'm going to show you a future cast here. It's different than our typical future cast. A lot of colors on the map. This really shows us the content of moisture in the atmosphere, which is really important, obviously, for making rainfall. And with this northerly wind here, due to the clockwise flow around these highs, we've got fairly dry air, indicated by the blue and purple color. That's the dry air, the low moisture content. That's going to last through Saturday. But notice, over the Gulf of Mexico, as usual, we've got a lot of moisture. And once we get into Sunday, our winds start to shift and that moisture is back. And I'm not just talking about, you know, mugginess here at the ground that we feel. I'm talking about moisture in the air from the ground all the way up through the clouds, the kind of moisture that the clouds turn into rain and ring out, the kind of moisture that makes tropical downpour. So that's back Sunday and into next week. Along with it, little bits of energy. That's why we boost those rain chances into the scattered category Monday through Wednesday and would likely be those tropical downpours developing in the afternoon hours. Temperature wise 98 right now dew point of 54. So it's nice to have a lack of mugginess in the air. Breaking the humidity right now dew points in the 50s. Not bad. All things considered and this is going to be the trend for the rest of the week and all the way into Saturday, you're not going to be noticing the thick humidity. So it's really just the heat and not the humidity. You can see where we have some rain cooled air junction. Now it's 75. Meanwhile, 103 Del Rio, 97 Gonzales, New Braunfels at 97, Cthulhu 101. This evening becoming mostly clear, uh, not too muggy out there. Temperatures gradually falling through the 80s and by midnight we will be at 80 degrees. Tomorrow we start at 70 by the afternoon. It's back to 100, we think, here in San Antonio. And most of South and Central Texas will be upper 90s, right near 100. But with that lack of humidity, which lasts through Saturday, sunny, hot, dry, but not humid as we go through the upcoming uh, start of the weekend, that is. And then as those rain chances go up, those temperatures go down closer to 90 by early next week. Thank you, Adam. All right, Larry, the Cowboys kick off the NFL season tomorrow with a trip to Tampa Bay and facing off with Tom Brady and the reigning Super Bowl champs. Yes, and Tom Brady is ready to see Dak Prescott, Cowboys starting quarterback, get back out on the field and show what he can do. And the quarterback that many call the GOAT, Brady, feels that Dak is going to be Dak. Plus, Coach Trailer out at UTSA says the removal of come and take it is out of his control. Coming up. We'll be excited, and uh, we're playing against a really good football team with a bunch of really talented players, and um, really well coached. So we're gonna have to play a great game. Tom Brady is looking forward to facing the Dallas Cowboys in Big Board Sports. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. We're about 25 hours away from the Dallas Cowboys and Tampa Bay Buccaneers kicking off the 2021 NFL regular season, and the biggest storyline heading into this one is all about Cowboys quarterback Dak Prescott. He told reporters he's excited for the moment and eager to get that first hit out of the way. When he takes the field tomorrow night, it will have been 333 days since he last played in a football game. A lengthy rehab for multiple ankle surgeries and a strained right shoulder kept him from getting hit during camp and from seeing a preseason snap.
Thursday night, night game, starting uh, starting the season off. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't want it any other way, to be honest. Um, I love night games, um, love playing on prime time. So I mean, I think it's 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 just uh, set for the perfect stage. Them coming off of uh, coming off of the Super Bowl title, um, and then obviously us having fans back to full capacity. I think this is what the, the NFL and the world needs. Seven-time Super Bowl champion quarterback Tom Brady is ready to start his second season with the Bucks. His first year with Tampa Bay was incredible, leading them to a Super Bowl crown. A fan of the game, Brady himself is looking forward to Dak's return. He's a really talented player. Um, really, since the day he got in the league, he's shown to be a great leader of the team. And um, you know, we're just expecting him to play like Dak, like Dak Prescott does. You know, he's very talented, moves in the pocket, throws a good ball. They got a lot of talented, skilled players. So for us offensively, we're going to have to do a good job putting our defense in a good position. I don't think we can give any extra possessions. Um, you know, turnovers will be a big factor. Field position is going to be important. Getting off the field on third down and us staying on the field, keeping the ball out of their hands is going to be important. Bucks will host the Cowboys tomorrow night at 720 from Raymond James Stadium. The Houston Texans are trading veteran cornerback Bradley Roby to the New Orleans Saints. Roby spent the last two seasons with the Texans where he had three interceptions and 15 passes defensed. He'll miss the first game of the season, however, as part of a six game suspension that began in 2020 for violating the NFL's policy on performance enhancing substances. No word yet on what Houston will get in return. After recent backlash, UTSA football is going to discontinue the slogan, come and take it. The first thing you see when you enter the Roadrunners brand new race building. UTSA President Taylor Amy said in an email sent to faculty, staff, students and alumni yesterday that the use of come and take it will end immediately. Head football coach Jeff Trailer said the president made his decision and his team is going to support that decision. He said their job as a football team is to win games. So is this controversy a distraction for the Roadrunners as they prepare for Lamar? It is what it is. There's always distractions and stuff, and that's why you have a brand. That's, that's why we talk about it every single day. Because if you look, and somewhere in there you got to be a man of integrity, you got to have some passion. You got to be mentally and physically tough. You got to be selfless. You got to give perfect effort. And if you do all those things, this is a great example of trusting the process. What does that mean to us? Control what we can control. We have no control over the situation whatsoever. UTSA will host Lamar Saturday, 5 p.m. at the Alamo Dome. Should be a good one. Thank you, Larry. Yep. We'll be right back. From, of course, the latest on COVID-19 in our community, also voter access, a police union contract. A lot to talk about with San Antonio Mayor Ron Nirenberg, who joins us today for our Q&A. As on most Wednesdays, Mayor, thanks for joining us once again here this evening. I want to talk about the signing of the new election law in, in Texas. The governor and other supporters of that are calling this a law about election integrity, but people who are opposed to it argue it is much more about voter suppression. Is there anything the city can do or is looking at doing to try to increase voter access? Well, we're going to be working with the election office at the county to make sure that we provide as much access as possible, uh, as easily as possible for folks of Bear County to vote. Um, you know, the, the sad truth of SB1 is that it is a partisan bill that was aimed at putting more obstacles in between people and their right to vote. Um, to the extent that you are limiting, uh, limiting um, people from mailing applications for mail-in ballot, things like that, reducing the ability for people to uh, drive up and vote, that, you know, if they have a, a, a handicap um, that uh, causes problems with getting to the polling site. There's a lot of things in the bill that were unnecessary um, and we're creating solutions to problems that don't really exist. So uh, we're going to continue to do everything we can to create access to the polls here in Bear County as we should be doing. Just to follow up on that, Mayor, real quickly, yesterday one of the suggestions that was put out there by a group was that maybe the city consider having a holiday, a citywide holiday on Election Day. Is that something that's on your radar at this point? Uh, it was mentioned, and, you know, I'm, I'm certainly supportive of, of uh, making Election Day as big an issue, a, a big an event as possible uh, here locally. And so we'll examine any opportunity we have to, again, expand access to the polls and make sure that every, everyone has uh, the ability and, and the easiest access to the poll as possible. 
Let's turn now to COVID-19. We saw some encouraging new numbers yesterday during the briefing. Our positivity rate is lower. It looks like numbers are headed in the right direction. Uh, what's your take right now on, in terms of where we are in this latest surge? What are you hearing from the people in the hospitals, Metro Health leaders? Uh, give us a perspective on that. We are in a tentative position right now. And what I think people are seeing is that there is more consciousness, more testing going on for COVID. So our positivity rate has been dropping uh, in large part because people are getting to, to the testing locations faster. Uh, we're identifying infections faster. But the truth of the matter is we are still very much in the midst of a surge to the point that the hospitals, the medical system is still overloaded. So we need to be very careful, continue to do uh, the proper health protocols, uh, mask wearing, uh, continuing to get more folks vaccinated. We need to continue to do that so that we can get our numbers under control. There is still a large number of people being admitted to the hospital every single day. Uh, and there is still a tremendous amount of infections that we're seeing among young people. Those are two serious concerns. And so while we are seeing some of the indicators move in the right direction, we cannot afford to let up on our mitigation of COVID in our community. Yeah, to follow up on that, Mayor, uh, last night at the briefing, uh, Judge Wolf said, you know, while the positivity rate was going down, we were st still seeing a steady increase amongst kids, students in school. Everybody's back now. How big of a concern yeah. is that? And what, what are you doing with the local school districts to kind of address that? Well, we are continuing to provide the guidance uh, directly from the CDC and our local public health authority for our local schools. And there is still a mask mandate in place, which is important. We know that kids are more resilient from COVID. However, with the increasing number of infections, we're also seeing increasing severe infections among children. And, and those numbers will continue to go up if our infections go up. So it's incredibly important for us to get our numbers under control, to get the infections and the transmission under control in our community broadly, so that we can also see the reduced impacts on our children. And let's keep in mind, again, children do not, children and under 12 are still not eligible for the vaccination. So we need to do everything we can if we are eligible to protect our young people. And that means getting vaccinated and everyone, regardless of vaccination status, wearing a mask. And you know, when it comes to the vaccination effort, of course, we, we're months in now to this, this plateau that we have seen and the effort to get more people vaccinated. Are we seeing an increase in those numbers in San Antonio? We have, in fact, as the, you know, as the Delta surge began to really take hold in, in San Antonio, there was an increase in vaccinations. We need to continue that. Um, it, you know, the, the truth is, while we are saying and while communities all across this country are saying that they've reached the threshold 70 and now 80 percent of folks who are eligible receiving at least one dose and over 70 percent now fully vaccinated, um, those are just eligible populations. So if you look at the entire population here in, in Bear County with 20% of that population being under 12 and ineligible for the vaccine, we need to be very careful that we don't fool ourselves into thinking that we've reached herd immunity because that is far from the truth. We need to continue to do what we can to get vaccinated if we're eligible. And then for those uh, who are not eligible uh, and everyone, regardless of vaccination status, while there's a surge, wear a mask. Meanwhile, a lot of talk about the, the need possibly for booster shots coming. Uh, there's still a lot of discussion about that, whether or not we will need the third shot for Pfizer and possibly Moderna at that point. Uh, what will that look like if the, we do need uh, boosters? Will we see a return of those mass vaccination sites? What are you guys doing to prepare for that? We are, and Metro Health has been working with uh, University Health and the hospitals uh, to coordinate uh, vaccine delivery. And that includes right now the first two shots. So we have reopened the mass vac site at the Alamo Dome on limited days, limited hours. But as uh, in, in anticipation of booster shots being, um, you know, authorized, I think you will start to see more mass vaccination vaccines uh, being delivered. So, um, you know, we're, we're still waiting for the FDA to weigh in on that. But once that happens, we will have our plan in place and executed. I want to switch gears now to negotiations with the police union on a contract with the city. That deal expires at the end of this month. That month is finally here. 
Uh, I, I know a lot's been going on that has, you know, taken up more room in the headlines, but that's certainly a conversation I know the city's engaged in. Can you give us an update? I know you're personally not involved in those negotiations, but have you sure. heard where things stand at this point and any changes when it comes to what the city's really been pushing for an increase in accountability for officers? Well, you know, I will say one thing. There is a marked difference in the negotiations that are taking place today and, and this year uh, than there was uh, five years ago in the previous contract. There's much less animosity. So the hopes for getting a deal that is suitable to the community and to our city are higher than they were five years ago. Um, the truth of the matter is, though, there's really one uh, big issue that we're working on, or, or you know, you can characterize it as transparency and accountability. Ultimately, getting, making sure that the chief has ultimate hiring and firing authority over the personnel in his department, and that those officers who are uh, found of, uh, you know, abusing the trust of the people, uh, who have been found of misconduct, are not brought back to the force after being fired. Uh, due, it, due, due, to, due to an arbitration process that is largely blind from the complete disciplinary records. We need to fix that. And outside of doing that, everything else is kind of working around the edges. And there has been good work on the contract um, around the edges, but we still have not struck the deal on, a, on accountability and transparency, which is the number one priority of our negotiations this year. I still have hope that we will reach that deal, um, but we need to deliver that and we will continue to work towards that until it's achieved. All right, and we'll continue to follow that. Mayor Ron Nirenberg, thanks as always for your time. My pleasure. Good to see you all. Thank you, sir. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Let's take a look at a couple of construction-related uh, things this evening, shall we? This is going to be on the far east side, far east Bear County, I-10 between FM 1516 and Loop 1604. Some construction out there, so it'll be a full eastbound closure beginning at 9, so in a, just a little more than two hours running overnight, so watch out for that. Have our still our lane closures here on Loop 1604 between I-10 and Bandera. That's between 9 p.m. again and 5 a.m. This runs through Friday, part of that big major construction project out there. Taking a look at things now, the travel times have greatly improved over the past hour, now down to 21 minutes between 281 and Bandera, 13 minutes going the other way. And here's a look at TransGuide. This is 1604 at Babcock, one of the areas we'll see that construction tonight. Still watching, though, a crash uh, farther south on 1604 near Calabra and State Highway 151. Tim and Myra. Thanks, Samuel. Look outside with live cam, 95 degrees right now. Coming off a holiday weekend, but a lot of people already thinking about the next one. So <laughs> how are the next couple of days looking at them? You know, very changeable. And I mean, our weather's always changing, but we're going to see some noticeable changes here in terms of humidity, morning low temperatures, afternoon highs, rain chances, and just overall moisture. There's a, there's a lot going on, a lot to talk about. But this evening, a few little showers out there here and there in the hill country. That's it. Otherwise, sunny, hot, but not too humid right now. 98 degrees currently in San Antonio, down into the lower 80s by 10 o'clock, and then tomorrow morning we'll start our day right near 70. But we'll have some even cooler mornings than that. We'll talk about that and much more coming up. In a lot of the parts of the country, when we shift the calendar from August to September, we start to think of cooler things, but here it just <laughs> means more heat. Not yeah, so much. September can be very hot here, and actually yeah. our hottest temperature on record occurred in early September, and that was 111 deg degrees back in the year 2000. Otherwise, let's talk about what's happening coming down the pike. It's going to stay hot near 100 degrees, but low humidity, that's the key. We're not going to be dealing with the mugginess as well, and that's going to lead to some cooler mornings. Even some 60s. That's something we haven't experienced around here since early June and promising rain chances ahead. I like what I see in terms of the shift in our weather pattern. So a lot of big noticeable changes to talk about. Let's start with temperatures, then we'll get to the rain chances and what's coming ahead. We're still well into the 90s, right near 100 degrees. 96 Randolph, Port SA 98, 99 Stinson. 92 though in Comfort and Kerrville, 92 Canyon Lake. Obviously temperatures fall off a bit as you get up into the hill country, but farther to the west along the Rio Grande, still some triple digits and even down in Catula. 
101 degrees. You notice junction mid 70s. That's because of some rain cool there. We'll look at the radar in a moment, but this is important. This is that drop in humidity and mugginess that we've been talking about for several days. Dew points now down into the 50s, so that puts us in the pleasant category. Remember, this is the true measure of the moisture content of the air, the dew point temperature, and when they're in the 50s, you really don't notice the mugginess outside. That's going to have an impact on our morning temperatures as well. Without the real thick humidity, our nights will be a little bit cooler. So tomorrow morning, right near 70 degrees. Friday and Saturday, we'll wake up to morning temperatures in the mid to upper 60s, and that's going to last through the entire weekend. So morning readings down in the 60s, and that's something we haven't had since early June, at least consistently. But notice by Monday of next week, those morning temperatures come up. That's a direct result of the humidity back in place. The flip side here is that our afternoon highs are going to be lower. So we'll be away from 100 by next week. Even Sunday, 100 is going to be completely out of the picture. And early next week, we're back down closer to 90 degrees, which is near the average high of 92 for this time of year. So that's temperature. Some cooler mornings over the next couple of days, and then our afternoon temperatures will be dropping off by Sunday and into next week. Rain, we've got some energy coming in from the Edwards Plateau, parts of the Hill Country as well. A few of these highly isolated showers and thunderstorms early this evening after sunset. They're going to have a hard time really sustaining themselves, but that's where the rain chances are. We're talking Hill Country and parts of I-10 generally west of Kerrville. That's that burst of energy coming from Dallas. This is one little uh, piece of energy and a little ripple in the atmosphere that's moving from Dallas toward Del Rio right now. That's the exception. Otherwise, Big Blue H over Utah. And of course, they always have the clockwise circulation around them. So that means we've got this northerly wind aloft and that north wind aloft is a fairly dry north wind. So here's a future cast of the moisture content in the atmosphere. Blue indicates a lack of moisture. You, know, you can't really generate clouds and showers with this blue color. This is going to be in place all the way through Saturday. The thicker humidity and more tropical like air. Notice on Saturday that's over the Gulf of Mexico as one would expect. But then by Sunday it moves back into town and early next week we really have a lot of moisture to wring out of the air. So we'll get the clouds and we'll have some energy to generate some showers and we're boosting those rain chances to about 40%. So scattered in nature by Monday through Wednesday and with that higher moisture content in our air, probably some of those tropical downpours, so heavy scattered showers developing, especially in the afternoons by next week. And right now it's looking fairly promising. So 70 in the morning tomorrow, low 90s though by the noon hour, back up near 100 and a good portion of South Texas outside of the hill country near 100. Stone Oak 99, Lavernia 99, La Soya Von Army about 100. And as I said, those temperatures drop off by Sunday and into next week with more promising rain chances. Thank you, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. Good morning to you. It is Wednesday, September 8th. Police were called out to the scene for a reported shots fire call. When they got there, they found the man with a gunshot wound to his back. He was taken to the hospital where he is expected to recover. Police say it looks like a domestic dispute. They believe the shooter may have been a family member. SAPD has not released details on the shooter. No word if charges will be filed. A man is dead after he accidentally shot himself last night. He has been identified as 21-year-old Jacob Anthony Salazar. According to San Antonio police, it happened at a home on Carlotta Avenue over on the west side. A witness told investigators Salazar was handling the gun before it went off, hitting him in the head. He was taken to the hospital but did not survive. A rapid surge in COVID cases among children spawning new disturbing milestones in the pandemic. U.S. hospitals on average now admitting more than 365 kids with the virus every single day, the highest level since the start of the pandemic. The Thomas Jefferson High School Junior ROTC came together to honor the fallen ahead of the anniversary of the 9-11 terror attacks. Students, staff, police and fire department members were all in attendance and Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar was the guest speaker. He says he encourages people not to just remember 9-11. 
Remember 9-10. Remember the last day that we all felt safe. Remember the, the day that we all had this false sense of security, like nothing would ever happen here, and then it turned out we were wrong. And so I urge them to live their lives, absolutely. Live your life, be happy, uh, but just be vigilant and know that things like terrorism can find their way into our society and find their way into our lives. Things have greatly improved on the uh, roadways this evening, but there are a couple of spots we're watching, including on the northwest side. Uh, this is near 1604 and Bandera. Some uh, slowdowns there as you approach Bandera and also on uh, Bandera Road, just a little north of 1604. Also, we had that crash there at 1604 in Calabria, but things do seem to be improving. Here's a look at 1604 and Bandera right now. Remember some construction later this evening, Adam. And other than a few isolated showers in parts of the hill country, we're by and large going to be clear this evening and not that humid. That's the nice thing. We have a lack of humidity, but tomorrow nothing but sunshine back up right near 100 for high temperatures, the mid 90s in the hill country. Converse about 98, 97 Castroville, Vaughn Army, Elmendorf right around or at 100 degrees. So near 100 for highs through Saturday. But we won't have the thick humidity. Humidity returns Sunday with better rain chances into next week. All right, thanks, Adam. And thanks for watching the News at 6. See you back here for the night beat tonight at 10. Until then, have a good evening.